I was a very involved high schooler. I was in many, many clubs. I sang in choir, I was on student council, I was involved in extracurriculars. Um, I, I loved high school. I had a lot of friends. Um, I got along with all my teachers and you know all the folks in the school. And I have really pleasant memories of high school. I was uh, just a, a, a fun-loving kid. I was, I was away uh, for the first time. I was in boarding school. And it was, it felt to me kind of like uh, the, the academics were very rigorous. I, I was a bit of a troublemaker, but never anything malicious. Uh, you know, just, just silly little stuff. Um, I was kind of always in trouble. I had pretty good study habits. Um, just like every other student, like to do things with my friends. And um, back then, we used to go to the drive-in theater on the weekends and um, go go shopping at the mall. And just kind of an average high school student of the '80s, I guess. As a high schooler, I was so confident. I really didn't believe there was anything I couldn't do. Um, I had a a part-time job. I was uh, get you know I made good grades. I was very involved with all kinds of different extracurriculars, and uh, I was always kind of creating my own projects to be doing. And so, uh, when a teacher treated me as an adult, whether that was just in terms of giving me more responsibility, or um, in kind of a less okay way of treating me like an adult by you know including me in on conversations that you know children really had no business being a part of. I felt like I belonged in those situations, and so um, when an off-color joke was told by a teacher, um, an adult, I, you know, I felt like, all right, cool, they, you know, they trust me. You know, I remember at the time he had really singled me out, and I, I felt, I felt special in a way that he had singled me out, and you know, it's nice to have that kind of attention. Um, but in particular at that time, I also remember there was another girl who was even more singled out and she got more attention than me. And I actually remember being worried about her, like what was happening, you know, was he really crossing lines with her because I knew that he had crossed lines with me and I couldn't imagine with that extra special attention and she was doing lots of personal errands for him and, um, you know, just in his classroom all the time. It just really made me wonder, like, what was going on there? I was in a science class, and we had a teacher, and he was a, he was a well-liked teacher. And so we would, you know, we would do our work and, um, and go chat with him and maybe joke around a little bit, and it, it was a, a pretty relaxed atmosphere in the, in the lab. Um, and I remember one day saying, um, Mr. So-and-so, what do you think I should be when I grow up? And he said, I think you should be an exotic dancer. And it, at the time, I, I thought it was funny. Um, but now, of course, um, you know, as an adult and as, um, as a teacher myself, I can see where that really could create an uncomfortable situation um, for, uh, for the student. And uh, maybe not even the student who, you know, to whom that was said, but maybe the other students in the class thinking, what, you know, what's going on there? That seems like an odd thing to say, even though he would say things like that. I, I never thought about it until years later, but when I was a sophomore in high school, I had a, a coach who on several occasions invited me to, to come to his apartment to watch movies and was, was appeared very disappointed when I, when I didn't. I had several other friends that did, but um, I just wasn't interested. I, uh, I didn't care much for sitting around and watching movies when, with a teacher when I could be out playing with my friends, so I never went. And it wasn't until 25 years later that I learned that uh, he was a, a sexual predator and uh, had been um, arrested and, and banned from campus.
Welcome to the final module in a three-part series uh, from the West Virginia Department of Education on preventing and responding to child abuse. I'm delighted to be here today with both of you. Uh, James Agee, who's an investigator with the West Virginia Department of Education, welcome. Thank you. And Susie Garrison. Susie's a teacher, coach, and a student council sponsor here in the West Virginia school system. Yes, thank you for having me. My name is Emily Chittenden Laird. I was the director of the West Virginia Child Advocacy Network for about a decade. But as a part of that role, I also was um, honored to be a part of the passage of Aaron Marin's law. So I'm excited to be here with both of you today to talk about the implementation of that law. So Susie and James, we just heard in the introduction voices of adults who are recounting experiences from their childhood where they experienced a boundary violation. So they experienced something that left them feeling confused or uncomfortable. We're here today to talk about those boundary violations, how we can keep professionalism high in the West Virginia school system, and how we can have types of relationships that really help students feel safe and supported. Okay. So James, I'm curious, when you listen to that introduction and all those voices, what did it make you think of? Uh, it makes me think that uh, it kind of the analogy of, of, of a fishing pole mm -hmm. and people that fish. Uh, the, people that are predators, people that are intent on uh, abusing anyone, the children especially, or students, it's always, they're always uh, have, a, have a baited hook out there in the water. And in this instance, that's the, the boundary invasion, whether it's the, um, the adult humor that they may throw out there or uh, getting in on someone's personal space or numerous other things. It's, it's always those little things to see how uh, the, the target of their affection may react. And so, James, you know a lot about this because of your unique role with the Department of Education. Can you describe your role to us? Uh, I investigate uh, teacher misconduct issues, educator misconduct issues, uh, coaching uh, misconduct issues uh, with an eye towards possible licensure uh, ramifications against a, an educator's license. So were the stories surprising to you? Not at all. Not at all. Something that you've seen a lot? It, it, we do, and it's not just one or two little boundary violations. It's, it's, it's clusters of violations. It's the little things. It's um, telling the joke that may be a little off-color and inappropriate in most settings, including in an educational, in a classroom setting. It might be uh, singling out a student for special recognition without something that attaches to that, like a grade or uh, some accomplishment. Uh, that would be natural and normal. It could be um, friending them on Snapchat, uh, which is a private communication. Uh, it could be um, uh, talking to that student about their personal issues. More importantly, talking to the student about the educator's personal issues. And again, that, that would be a, uh, some of the things that we do see on a quite regular basis. So, you know, that's how it starts, but how does it progress? It, it just moves on from there. Once, once they, uh, in this instance, say a predatory behavior, once they've established that there's a possible opening, then they will move on to any, anything further. That could be meeting outside of school, late at night, um, outside of uh, legitimate education or legitimate uh, athletic event. It could be um, uh, meeting up for dinners. It could mean meeting up for other activities, going to movies, things like that. You know, I think, though, there's a counterpoint to all of this, which is that most teachers have very appropriate, respectful relationships with students. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Moving from a teaching role to a coaching role to mentoring and whatever activity it might be with your kids, as long as you're keeping the things in place that you know you're supposed to be keeping you know, your professional protocol must be followed all the time. Whatever is said to the student athlete or student council person or whoever it is, as long as it's in that educational realm, if I wouldn't say this to the whole group and mean that I'm including everybody, it shouldn't be something that would even be broached. Mm -hmm. James, if you're a part of a school faculty or support staff, and you observe a behavior that you think a uh, boundary has been crossed, what should you do? Uh, know the avenue of appropriate re reporting within the school system that you're in. What's the protocol? Uh, 
that's usually covered in your trainings. It goes through your counselors or your administrators more likely, and then out through the chain of command into the, uh, the board office with the superintendent's office. Um, we also accept here at the Department of Education anonymous reports and other reports direct from the field uh, if, if they need to go outside of those channels. So Susie, you are a veteran teacher, and so you're able to have those types of conversations, which is great. Mm -hmm. But it, what it makes me think about is what about the new teacher in a school who has observed a behavior from a teacher that is very tenured, that is senior to them, that may have a lot of respect in the community? That's hard. The, the power differential is very different. Absolutely. You know, you do want to incorporate the caring and the compassion and the communal, you know, the taking care of one another and our community. So the biggest rule that I think that, you know, it's, it's difficult for a younger teacher, but see something, say something. You know, and if you feel uncomfortable going to that veteran teacher directly, you can, again, have the side conversation. Maybe say, hey, I know this seems really strange, but... That, that kind of set me on edge to watch that interaction between you two, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then kind of get a feel. You know, if you're a teacher, you, you're, you're probably going to have some kind of vibe that that teacher accepted what you said and said, oh, gosh, or no, I'm going to do what I want. And then you would know how to progress. Do you go to a superior? Do you do you? you know, let it ride. And what you're really talking about, I think, is this culture of support mm -hmm. and care and concern for children, right. but also a culture of professional accountability absolutely. that you're sharing with one another. Yes, absolutely. And that's, again, number one, you have, you've got to be professional. Yeah. So I can imagine, though, that that's not always possible. And James, I'm curious, if someone really feels like they can't report up, maybe it's the principal at their school. Mm -hmm. Is there a resource at the Department of Education? Uh, we accept uh, reports from the field. We accept anonymous reports uh, about alleged misconduct, and uh, we do like to involve the counties on those, so we'll reach back down into the county uh, to through the superintendent's office uh, sometimes uh, if, if, it, if that's the proper way to do it. So, uh, yeah, we do accept those reports, and even anonymous. We would rather have that information than not have it. And then I think, you know, it's important as a maybe not – a newer teacher coming in and, and not being sure about something to let the teachers know also, you know, be comfortable, S see something, say something, make sure you're reporting. I don't think that it's ever okay to overlook something because where you're talking about the small things happen and they build up, that's where it starts a lot of times. I mean, you can be going overboard, but it's better to be safe than sorry. So it sounds like there are situations where a teacher crosses a boundary. I imagine there are also times when students try to cross that boundary as well. They can, and um, they often do. And it's up to that educator to um, to stop that, to to assert their authority as the as the educator, as the coach, as the uh, support staff member to to assert their role and what their role is. And those students crossing those boundaries probably do happen frequently whenever you're, you're in an after-school mm -hmm. setting. So you're in a choir practice sure. or a band practice or you're on a you know, soccer trip. Or... Right. And actually, professionally, the best thing that I think is to be very frank and honest with the student first and foremost, but then step to the parent or the guardian next. You know, a lot of times that's going to stop a lot of the behavior mm -hmm. in the event that it would go further then you would go on to reporting it and following the pr protocol that you're supposed to. Just like any classroom Absolutely. disruption. Absolutely. Any kind of educational professional setting. Mm -hmm. Yep. So one of the things that I can imagine must be really difficult for teachers is how to respond when a student has a crush on you or an infatuation with you. Do you have any advice about that? Basically, just, again, I don't have favorites, and I let everybody know that, you know, they, they oh, we're your favorite class, or I'm your favorite athlete, or whatever. No, you just don't engage it. Oh, no, that's not appropriate. And then you kind of get into the point where if the adult is, is feeling a little strange, that's you need to reach out to somebody mm -hmm. else. You need to go to a counselor. You need to go to your supervisor or somebody and say, you know, or, or the student's parent and say, this is what's happening, you know, documentation, just like we do with any kind of abuse. Things are different than when I was growing up. Now we have social media, which is a big part of um, how children communicate. Um, so how do you make sure that you are using social media appropriately? 
Um, first and foremost, absolutely positively, I don't friend or accept friend requests from anybody who's my current student or athlete or anything. I just, I just don't. I mean, it's just not acceptable. Um, you know, we have in policy that you shouldn't, but I make sure that I enforce within my English department and, and with my coaches, you just don't. I mean, it's just not an option. So, James, I'm curious, how many cases that you investigate have social media as an element? All of them. In a the case of sexual misconduct, um, all of them have an element of social media communication that have led up to that. Wow. So it sounds like being able to um, consistently implement a protocol that Susie just described to us, where you're not accepting friend requests and not having that direct communication, really would help prevent these boundary violations. It 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 would prevent it from from occurring because the avenue wouldn't be there. Um, and, and, and it's not the open communication on a social media aspect, it's the private communication. Snapchat is, is, is very private. Direct message is private. Facebook Messenger is private. Uh, there's no parental involvement. So, uh, you know, those are things that you do within your peer group. And the teacher is not the student's peer. It's peer-like behavior, and that's one of the warning signs that we look for. Hmm. So it sounds like um, preventing that really um, keeps us from those lower level boundary violations that we've discussed. If we can prevent those, they don't accumulate to the higher levels. That's correct. And sometimes it's the younger teacher uh, that, that has been thrown, thrown out there maybe a little too quickly. And it takes those veteran teachers to you know, pull them aside and, and tell them, you know, this is, this is how we do things at this school. And that gets back to the professional accountability Absolutely. that you were describing. That's, you know, when you say the younger teachers, it's, it's not necessarily age-wise, but experience-wise, right? Mm -hmm. And so it could be that they are completely harmless and not realizing that they are doing it because in our generations that are younger, we have that relaxed attitude already. Mm -hmm. And things are very flip and very casual, and it's easy to come from the classroom and come into the classroom as the teacher and forget that, oh, wait, I have to have that professional shield up. And, and so they're just engaging with their kids and going, oh, you look cute or, you know, making a comment where if you don't accept the friend request, if you don't engage, you don't have that situation you're putting yourself into. So it might be that, you know, things are happening innocently, truly, but then it would build and go on and, you know, just nip it in the bud. So what about um, the folks who are watching this and, um, you know, have the best of intentions, but realize through the course of watching this that they have inadvertently crossed one of those right. boundaries? What do they do? I mean, I call that a noops moment. You know, you oh, probably shouldn't have friended anybody. You just stop. Just don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Disengage. Ideally, get off of the social media platform altogether. But, you know, say sorry. Can't do it. Yeah. That's all. The key thing that we see uh, when it gets violated, this, these boundary violations get violated, are uh, the peer-like behavior. Is what's the motivation behind it? Is is it for legitimate health reason? Is it for a legitimate educational reason or legitimate safety reason? Uh, if it's not one of those three, it's probably incorrect, and they shouldn't be doing that. Um, again, the veteran educator, the good educator, the concerned educator—it's not an issue because they just don't do that. Um, but at the same time, it's, we, we look for those clusters. If it's private communication that is kept private, why? Knowing that 99% of the teachers and school service personnel who are watching this are great people with the best of intentions, what are the things that they can do to safeguard themselves? Uh, knowing the rules, knowing what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. Uh, anything that they do within their job legitimate education, legitimate safety, or legitimate health issues. And those are, those are pretty easy to identify. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, safety and concern for the students is everyone's responsibility. Right, I agree. Um, I think if you can maintain the three, three is my number. So maintain your professionalism. Make sure that your kids are safe and you're safe. And that way, everybody feels empowered. You know, you want a thriving culture, a thriving community. Everybody performs better when they feel safe and confident, whether that's in the classroom, um, professionally on the field, if you're coaching or in whatever spectrum. Make sure that you're maintaining proper communication with the students. It doesn't look like you're being sloppy and, and hanging out on a Saturday night with some friends. You know, that's not what the situation is. It's always educational. It's always within the parameters of being at um, 
professional and make sure that you're handling your business in all of those areas. And having students address you with your professional title, I imagine, is really important. Absolutely, yeah. There's, you know, I'll allow a Miss G, but never, you know, never my first name, Mm -hmm. never, hey, Garrison. You know, I mean, even something like that is just not appropriate. And James, I can imagine that these are things that you have seen crossed in your investigations. Absolutely. Uh, she brought the point about addressing in the, with a non-professional title or just with a first or last name. Sometimes that's where it starts. And if the educator's not projecting that right off the bat, uh, that can open the door to other things. Susie, you grew up here in the community where mm-hmm. you teach. Mm-hmm. And you've had children who have been in the school system. So I know that there are relationships that you have outside this context. Um, sure. You know, your, your casual c- relationships. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Um, so whenever, for example, your sons have someone come over, um, how do you handle that in maintaining your professionalism as a teacher? Actually, I do it the same way I would anything else. If I'm in my classroom, if they're still, they still address me. They're not allowed to address me as Susie. They still address me as coach or as Miss Garrison. You know, I just, even in my own house, because they have to understand, it's easier for me to remember to be professional than it is for a kid. And so if I would allow that slippage, it, it, would, it would bleed into, you know, the, the professional realm. And so I just don't. Well, I think that's great because what it says to me is nobody needs to be scared out of the normal functions of their everyday right, life. Right, 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 right. We want to be able to have our kids' friends over, but Absolutely. maintaining that professionalism across all realms mm-hmm. really keeps those boundaries clear. Absolutely. In the child advocacy world, we have something that we refer to as protective factors. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of research around protective factors, and it's really looking at the things that help kids thrive even when abuse occurs in their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, So we know that at the top of that list, the number one thing that helps kids be resilient is a relationship with a caring adult. What are the things that you do to foster that? Um, They know right from the moment they come to me, whether it's as a coach or as a teacher, that my number one job is to keep them safe, that if they need to tell me something, they can. If it's going to be something that's harmful to them or to somebody else, I'll report it immediately. I mean, again, protocol. But it's also welcoming them and making them feel safe within that environment. And Susie, we want kids to have positive relationships with educators like you. So if something happens and a boundary is violated and they need to tell someone, Mm -hmm. they have a safe place to come. Right. And as a teacher role, as a coach role, I do have the qualifications to care and support them, but I'm also not trained to counsel them fully. So in the event that a student would come to me, I know that they're going to understand. They're, I'm going to make it clear that they understand that this is a bigger problem than I can help you with. We're going to go to a counselor, a therapist, or somebody who's within the school system that knows how to handle that the correct way for them. Mm-hmm. So, Susie, what I love about what you just said is that being clear about your role, that you can support that child in that moment of disclosure, yeah. but that you're not an investigator. Um, you do have to make that mandated report like we discussed in Module 2 extensively, mm-hmm. um, that you do want to make sure that they get, get the support of a mental health professional. All those things really will help that child in the long run. Right. Absolutely. And again, making sure that you are comfortable yourself with knowing what the protocol is. How do I go forward and and help this student and do what's legally right to protect myself too? you know, Mm -hmm. be careful with my own boundaries, Mm -hmm. you know, that I don't violate something. And definitely, you know, you're not having the side conversations. You're not talking about this in the hall, that you're going through the correct steps that you're supposed to follow every single time. Absolutely. You know, in my decade of working with survivors, Mm -hmm. whenever I talk to them about the thing that helped them the most Mm -hmm. in the moment of their disclosure, it frequently was that the person that they disclosed to listened to them Mm -hmm. and cared for them and supported them. So I know that even though you are making those connections to other people who are helping support those kids, um, if they've had an adverse childhood experience like we talked about in the first module, Even though they've had that experience, having that support from a teacher whenever they make that disclosure means all the world to them. Right. It's a bridge. You know, I I can consider myself a bridge or anybody, any other educator could. You know, and and if you're not 
um, qualified to handle what the students are bringing in, you have to be okay with saying, this is a little more than what I'm comfortable with or what I know that I, I'm able to deal with, also from a legal standpoint. So we also have school service personnel, um, school staff, all the people that work with children in the school setting. Uh, they all play an important role as well. Uh, absolutely. They uh, see these students every day, particularly in the smaller schools, particularly in elementary schools, and, and they can have very uh, uh, close professional relationships with them. They, they get to know their names and, and see them grow up. And uh, their views and their concerns are just as valid as anyone else's. And they may be in a position to see certain interactions that, that other educators uh, may not see, uh, that administrators may not even see. Yeah, and they have the benefit of a lot of times sticking with those students all throughout their history at that school. Absolutely. Uh, certain support staff, you know, are, are with that student the entire time they're in that building. And uh, they can be in a position to, to definitely see something. James, Susie, thank you so much for being with me today to talk about this important issue. I think yeah. that your professional experience as a coach and a teacher and a mentor to many students has been very illuminating about how we can remain professional right. and not cross those lines. And James, you're so committed to making sure that our schools remain safe through your professional role of investigating allegations when they come forth. And um, your commitment is so evident today in what you've shared with us. I think the thing that we're all in agreement about is that we want a culture in our schools that is professional mm -hmm. and where students feel validated and safe and supported. And I think that with this discussion and with these clear boundaries, we're one step further down that path in making sure that students feel safe.